welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. This is a great place for anyone who's ever been accused of being morbid, which I have been, specifically by my husband, because I was so fascinated with things like disasters. And he asked me why I was interested in stuff like that. And, you know, for, for me personally, I can't speak for anyone else, but I love the stories of survivors and how they made it out. And it's interesting for me to think about how I would handle that situation, uh, whether it's the sinking of the Titanic or being trapped in the two towers or, you know, any of the Hindenburg. And the answer is probably I would die. <laughs> probably. I would, uh, I don't know. Um, definitely, like, if there's a zombie apocalypse, I don't know how to grow my own food or, uh, I, I'm the, you know, I'm the red shirt in Star Trek. More than likely. But I'm really fascinated with people who do survive things like that. And I think their stories are amazing. I'm more interested in them, for sure, um, than, than anything else. So, I'm going to start today. That my This is video number one of Madam Morbid, uh, and it's going to be a witness to history. I'm going to do this as a series. Not every video I'm going to do is going to be like this, but I do plan to do several of these and if you have other ideas of ones you'd like to see in the future please let me know but I worked in an archive for a while and it's what I'm trained in and so my, my first video is going to be about Margaret Brown and Margaret Brown you know her as Molly Brown and she survived the sinking of the Titanic she has become more of a myth than anything since her death in the 1930s but I'm going to, so I'm going to read to you exactly what she saw, exactly as she reported it. And some of it's a little bit of a challenging read. She was a big fan of run-on sentences. So uh, I did the best I could. For those of you, I'm just going to give it some historical context. Margaret Brown was never called Molly. She only became known as that after she died. And it was invented basically by Broadway when they wrote the musical The Unsinkable Molly Brown. Some of you may have seen the film. I believe the show was recently, within the last couple of years, came back on Broadway. Wish I could have seen it. A lot of the, the legends surrounding Margaret Brown come from that show. And a lot of legends about her were going around at the time of when she was alive and uh, people asked her like the story about her husband burning the payroll and uh, putting the payroll in the stove and her burning it. Uh, she was asked, why do you let that story keep going around? And she said, well, because it's a damn good story. So she didn't make any huge effort to kill these stories and stop them and say, you know, that never really happened. She didn't care, you know, um, they want to tell a good story? Fine. She was 46 when the Titanic set sail. She'd been traveling abroad with her daughter, Helen. They had gone to Egypt and they'd been all over Europe. They'd gone to Paris. And she got word that her grandson, who was an infant at the time, was sick. So she came home very last minute. A lot of her family had no idea she was even on the Titanic. She just booked passage right before it left, and her daughter knew, but a lot of her other family didn't know. So when this disaster happened, they didn't even know she had been involved. She got her name unsinkable when doing a, an interview, I believe, with a reporter, and he asked her what she attributed her survival to, and she made a comment like, uh, sure, uh, I forget exactly how she said it. Something about sheer brown luck. We're unsinkable. So it kind of stuck. After that, she was known as the, the unsinkable Molly Brown. She was a very wealthy woman, but she was not born that way. She grew up in Hannibal, Missouri, the daughter of Irish immigrants. 
and she spent a lot of her life advocating for immigrants and how they were treated in the United States. She was a progressive. She was on the side of the working man, which her husband was in mining, and when there was a strike, he was always on the side of the company, and she would be on the side of the workers. So that kind of got in the way of their marriage a little bit, and they had been separated since 1909 when this when the Titanic sank. So she was living her life and he was living his and they pretty much didn't ask questions. They were never going to get divorced because they were uh she was they were both, I guess, staunchly Irish Catholic. So she was never they were never going to do that. And her husband is purported to have said when he found out that she was fine and that she she uh, had had made it he is supposed to have said she's too mean to sink so uh yeah they had they had a tumultuous relationship at times but uh she was she traveled the world all the time she had she traveled before and she traveled long after titanic ended but she was very angry there were two inquiries after the titanic sank which again, it was on its maiden voyage and it was supposedly top of the line, had all of these precautions to keep a, a ship afloat if it had anything happen and it ended up sinking. So there were inquiries into what, why this happened. There was one in New York and then there was one in, uh, great, in London, in Britain. And women were not allowed to testify at these and this made... Margaret Brown extremely angry and so she said well by God people are going to know my story and so she published it in the Newport Herald which she had a home in Newport Connecticut and a summer home she spent a lot of time there and so it was published in three parts I'm reading it the whole thing for you here but um they broke it in weird places, so I just went ahead and went uh, and read the whole thing, and it ends very abruptly as well. But I hope you guys enjoy it. It's very interesting. At the end, I will be discussing things that she talks about and my take on her uh, account. You always have to be careful with first-person accounts. First of all, memory is very, it's just bad. You know, five minutes after something has happened, our minds trick us. And we start to remember things that didn't happen or that happened in a different way. And it just happens. And the longer time passes, the, the more that can happen. This was published May 28th. 27th uh, of 1912 so I am actually doing this on the day I'm recording this on the day it the anniversary of it appearing in the Newport Herald which is kind of neat so sit back relax and enjoy Margaret's account a special boat train from Paris reached Cherbourg at 5 p.m. April 10th when we arrived, no steamer in sight. She was late, having met with some difficulties in leaving the docks at Liverpool. We all boarded the tender that was waiting to convey the hundreds of passengers to the master palace of the sea that proved later to be the tomb of many of them. After an hour or more of waiting in the cold, gray atmosphere, the funnels of the Titanic, the world's greatest masterpiece of modern ocean liners, appeared over the other side of the breakwater. In a few minutes more, this wonderful floating palace hove in sight around the curve of the dike and dropped anchor. The tender put on the steam, and after half an hour in a running sea, we were alongside the keel of the Titanic. The tossing of the small craft in the choppy sea caused most of the passengers to be uncomfortable and actively ill. All were chilled through. On boarding the vessel, the great number of the passengers immediately sought their staterooms, 
The bugle for dinner sounds a half hour later, but it was unsuccessful in calling forth many to its magnificent dining saloon. The electric heater and warm covering were found too comfortable to be deserted even for the many course dinner. The second day broke clearer and less crisp, and half after twelve found most of the passengers promenading the deck or basking in the warm sun outside the palm garden. There were long benches on the long bow of the boat for those who found the swayback steamer chairs uncomfortable. The last half hour lapsing between the first and second gongs, when all take their exercise before descending into the dining hall, most of the passengers are to be found walking, enveloped in heavy wraps. The women were in luxurious furs, and the men in heavy overcoats, buttoned closely around their necks and partly disguised in steamer caps. In passing to and fro, they discovered old friends on board, and some made new ones. Small groups were standing here and there, discussing the ship and its marvels, its possibility for speed, and all its wonderful advantages over anything of its kind, heretofore put afloat. Each and all seemed to have consulted the log as to the distance covered that day at noon, and was the topic of conversation on deck and at the table at the luncheon hour. After luncheon, or about 2.30, the favorite and popular place was the reading room, where the passengers settled themselves comfortably with some chosen book from the well-equipped library on the ship. Others were taking a quiet siesta on the deck, wrapped in heavy steamer rugs. Few remained in their staterooms, for the sea was perfectly calm and no vibration was felt. Consequently, there was little or no mal de mer. Thus, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday were passed. Sunday services were held at 10.30, quite one half of the passengers attending and on deck, but all were restlessly searching for a warm place. The comfortable chairs in the lounge held but a few as a shaft of cold air seemed to penetrate every nook and corner and chill the marrow. Heavy furs and warm clothing were donned. Dinner time found few inclined to shed their warm clothing for dinner dress. Even the innumerable brides, who on various occasions appeared in a different Paris creation each night, could not be induced to change. Though the board groaned with viands, the passengers found it uncomfortable to sit through the many course dinner. Many sought their staterooms immediately afterwards. The writer sought some exceedingly intellectual and much traveled acquaintances. A Mrs. Bucknell, whose husband has founded the Bucknell University of Philadelphia, and Dr. Brew of Philadelphia, who has done much in scientific research. During our conversation that I had had with her on the tender while waiting for the Titanic, she said she feared boarding the ship. She had evil forebodings that something might happen. We laughed at her premonitions and shortly afterwards sought our quarters. Anxious to finish a book, I stretched on the brass bed at the side of which was a lamp. So completely absorbed in my reading, I gave little thought to the crash that struck at my window overhead and threw me to the floor. Picking myself up, I proceeded to see what the steamer had struck. On emerging from the stateroom, I found many men in the gangway in their pajamas, whom I had overheard a few moments before, entering their staterooms saying that they were nearly frozen and had to leave the smoking rooms. They, while standing, were chafing each other. One of them remarked, are you prepared to swim in those things? Referring to the pajamas. Women were standing along the corridors in their kimonos. All seemed to be quietly listening, thinking nothing serious had occurred, though realizing at the time that the engines had stopped immediately after the crash, and the boat was at a standstill. And as there was no confusion of any kind, the book was again picked up. On hearing the occupants of the adjoining stateroom say, We will go on deck and see what has happened. I again arose 
and saw six or more stewards and one officer in the corridor forcing an auger through a hole in the floor while treating the whole thing with levity. Again, returning to my book, presently I saw the curtains moving, but no one was visible. I again looked out and saw a man whose face was blanched, his eyes protruding, wearing the look of a haunted creature. He was gasping for breath, and in an undertone he gasped, Get your lifesaver! I immediately reached above and dragged all out, as I thought some others might need them. Snatching up furs and placing a silk capote on my head, I hurriedly mounted the stairs to A-deck, and there I found possibly fifty passengers, all putting on their life belts. Strapping myself into mine, I afterwards was told to go up on the storm deck. My party that I was traveling with had already gone up. On reaching A-deck, Mrs. Bucknell approached and whispered to me, Didn't I tell you something was going to happen? On reaching the storm deck, we found a number of men trying to unravel the tackle of the boats to let them down, which seemed at the time very difficult. We were approached by an officer and told to descend to the deck below. We found the lifeboats there were being lowered from the falls and were at the time flush with the deck. Madame de Valier of Paris appeared from below in a nightdress and evening slippers with no stockings over which she wore a woolen motor coat. She clutched my arm and in a terrified voice said she was going below for her money and jewels. After much persuasion, I prevailed upon her not to go down, but to get into the boat. As she hesitated and became very excited, I told her it was all only a precaution and she would be able to return to the then sinking steamer later. After she got on, I turned and found the lady of my party in a lowering boat. I was walking away, eager to see what was being done with the boats on the other side, not fearing any immediate danger, thinking if the worst should happen, I could swim out. Suddenly, I saw a shadow, and a few seconds later, I was taken hold of, and with the words, you are going too. I was dropped fully four feet into the lowering lifeboat. When I got in, on looking around, I saw but one man who was in charge of the boat. While being lowered by jerks by an officer from above, I discovered that a great gush of water was spouting through the porthole from D-deck, and our lifeboat was in grave danger of being submerged. I immediately grasped and oar and held the lifeboat away from the ship. While being lowered, we were conscious of strains of music being wafted on the night air. As we reached a sea as smooth as glass, we looked up and saw the benign, resigned countenance, the venerable white hair, and the Chesterfieldian bearing of our beloved captain, with whom I had crossed twice before, only previous on the Olympic. Our party sat at his table. As he peered down upon us like a solicitous father, directing us to row to the light in the distance and all boats keep together. With but one man in the boat and possibly 14 women, I saw that it was necessary for someone to bend to the oars. I placed mine in the rowlocks and asked a young woman near me to hold one while I placed the other one on the further side. To my surprise, she immediately began to row like a galley slave every stroke counting. Myself, on the other side, we managed to pull out from the steamer. All the time while rowing, we were facing the starboard side of the sinking vessel. By the time E and C decks were completely submerged and the strains of music became fainter, as though the instruments were filling up with water. Suddenly, all ceased when the heroic musicians could play no more. The only seaman in our boat was the quartermaster. He was at the rudder and standing much higher than we were. He was shivering like an aspen. As we pulled away from the boat, we heard sounds of firing and were told later that it was officers shooting as they were letting down the boats from the steamer, trying to prevent those from the lower decks jumping into the lifeboats. 
Others said it was the boilers. The quartermaster in command of our boat burst out in a frightened voice and warned us of the fate that awaited us, telling us our task in rowing away from the sinking ship was futile, as she was so large that in sinking she would draw everything for miles around down with her suction. And if we escaped, that the boilers would burst and rip up the bottom of the sea, tearing the icebergs asunder and completely submerge us. We were truly doomed either way. He dwelt on the dire fate awaiting us, narrating at great length the incidents that happened at Liverpool, how two large steamers, the New York and one other, were drawn under and almost capsized, we all the while bending to the oars with a vengeance, tugging on. All occupants of the lifeboats remained as mute as the dead, all standing erect, clustered in the middle of the boat. Presently, we heard shouts and cries of terror from the fast sinking ship. We were told the shouts were from the trunk men on the collapsible boat. Our quartermaster haggled long and loud. The splash of the oars partly drowned the voices of the perishing men on the doomed steamer. The ladies all seemed terrified. Those having husbands, sons, or fathers buried their heads on the shoulders of those near them and moaned and groaned only. While my eyes were glued on the fast disappearing ship, I particularly watched the broad promenade deck. It was fully lighted but not one moving object was visible. Suddenly, a rift in the water. The sea opened up and the surface foamed like giant arms spread around the ship. And the vessel disappeared from sight and not a sound was heard. When none of the calamities that were predicted by our terrified boatsmen was experienced, we asked him to return and pick up those in the water. Again, we were admonished and told how the frantic drowning victims would grapple the sides of our boat and capsize us. He not yielding to our entreaties, we pulled away vigorously toward a faintly glimmering light on the horizon. After three hours of pulling at the oars, the light grew fainter and then completely disappeared. Then our quartermaster, who stood on his pinnacle trembling with an attitude like someone preaching to the multitude, fanning the air with his hands, recommenced his tirade of evil forebodings, tell us we were likely to drift for days, all the while reminding us that we were surrounded by icebergs, pointing to a pyramid of ice looming up in the distance possibly 70 feet high, reflected by the myriad stars in the sky. It looked like a black shaft. He most forcibly impressed upon us that there was no water in the casks in the lifeboat and no bread, no compass, and no chart. No one answered him. They all seemed to be dumbstruck. One of the ladies in the boat had had the presence of mind to procure her silver brandy flask. As she held it in her hand, the silver glittered, and he, being attracted to it, implored her to give it to him, saying he was frozen. She refused the brandy, but removed her steamer blanket and put it around his shoulders, while another lady wrapped a second blanket around his waist and limbs. He looked as snug as a bug in a rug. We asked him to relieve one or the other at the oars, saying to him that we would manage the rudder. He flatly refused and continued to rampoon us at the oars, shouting out, Here, you fellow on the starboard side, your oar is not being put in the water at the right angle. No one made any protest to his outburst as he broke the monotony, but we continued to pull at the oars with no real goal in sight. Presently, he raised his voice, shouting to another lifeboat to pull near and lash too commanding some of the other ladies to take the light and signal to the other lifeboats. His command was immediately obeyed, that and one other command, that we drop the oars and lie fallow until we were rescued. 
Sometime later, after more shouts, a lifeboat hove to and obeyed his orders to throw a rope and was tied to ours. Alongside, she dropped oars, and on the cross seat of that boat stood a man in white pajamas. He looked like a snowman in that icy region. His teeth were chattering, and he appeared quite numb. Seeing his predicament, I told him he had better get to rowing to keep his blood in circulation, which was not with forcible protest with our quartermaster. We, after the exercise, felt the blast from the icy field and demanded that we be allowed to row to keep warm. Immediately, over into our boat jumped a half-frozen stoker, black and covered with coal dust. Dressed as he was in thin jumpers, I picked up a large sable stole that I had dropped in the boat and from his waist lying down, wrapped it around his limbs, tying the tails around his ankles. I handed him an oar, and then I told the pajama man to cut loose, and a howl arose from our seaman. He moved to prevent it, and I said if he did, he would be thrown overboard. I felt a hand laid on my shoulder to stay my threats, knowing it would not be necessary to push him over. Had I only moved in his direction, he would have tumbled into the sea, so paralyzed was he with fright. He had, by this time, worked himself up to such a pitch of sheer despair, fearing that a scramble of any kind would remove the plug from the bottom of the boat. It had taken three of us some length of time to feel around, find it, and place it in the hole, and if it were displaced, the water would sweep in, and there was grave danger of filling the boat. The quartermaster became very impertinent, and our fur-enveloped stoker, in a broad cockney as one hears in the haymarket, shouted, Soy, don't you know you're talking to a lady? For the time being, the seaman was silenced, and we again sat at our task. Two other ladies came to the rescue of those rowing and caught hold of oars and backed the water. Thus, we aimlessly tugged on over the vast waste of water. Lights were flashed from other lifeboats miles away. While glancing around, watching the edge of the horizon, the beautifully modulated voice of the English young woman at the oar exclaimed, There is a flash of light! All looked in the direction, pointed out, and our pessimistic seaman said, That's a falling star. It became lighter and later was multiplied by others on the lighted deck. He was convinced then that it was a ship. He said it was the Olympic, as she was to have passed after midnight. Then he gave a sigh of relief, and again ordered us to drop the oars. We saw this steamer approaching, some small lifeboats near her, while we were then possibly six or eight miles off. However, the distance seemed interminable. We saw she was anchored. Again, a declaration was made that we, regardless of what our quartermaster said, would row toward her. Again, the young Englishwoman from the Thames got to work, accompanying her strokes with cheerful words to the wilted occupants of the boat. A little while later, dawn disclosed the awful situation. There were fields of ice on which, like points in the landscape, rested innumerable pyramids of icy peaks. Seemingly, a half hour later, the sun, like a ball of molten lead, appeared at its background. The hand of nature portrayed a scenic effect beyond the ken of human mind. The heretofore smooth sea became choppy, which seemed to retard our progress. All the while, we saw the small lifeboats being hauled aboard. By the time we reached the Carpathia, a heavy sea was running. Our boat, being the last to approach, we found it difficult to get close. Three or four unsuccessful attempts were made. Each time we were dashed against the keel and bounded off like a rubber ball. A rope was then thrown to us, which was spliced in four at the bottom, where a wide board was held in four large knots. Feast first, we got on and sat on the seat that formed a swing. Catching hold of the one thick rope, we were hoisted up to where a dozen of the crew and officers and doctors were waiting. Stimulants were given to those who needed them, and hot coffee was provided for all the survivors. 
Everything was done for our comfort. The Carpathia passengers, sharing their staterooms, clothes, and toilet articles, they then retiring to the far corner of the ship, where then deck chairs were placed, giving the lounge up completely to the survivors, and in the two succeeding foggy, murky days, when the deck was too damp to sit out, they remained in their stuffy staterooms rather than use the space there. After picking up the lifeboats, only half filled, the ship reconnoitered for hours around the place where the Titanic had sank. In doing so, they passed 50 miles of ice fields, so I was told, endangering their own safety in their endeavor to rescue more. On entering the dining salon, I saw in one corner our brave and heroic quartermaster with a cluster of people around him. He was wildly gesticulating, trying to impress upon them what difficulty he had had in disciplining the occupants of his boat. On seeing a few of us near, he did not tarry long, but made a hasty retreat. On the swivel chairs in the dining salon were seated the titanic survivors. They were speechless, half clad, their eyes protruding, hair streaming down. Those who only 12 hours before were immaculately groomed and richly gowned and furred, evidence of vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Here they sat, shaven and shorn, and in utter hopelessness and despair, almost all bereft of husbands and sons, fathers and brothers. Unable to grasp the situation, they sat mute, not being able to realize in the one short hour before a quarter of twelve, when the boat struck, and somewhat after one when she sank, that their dear ones were swallowed up in the jaws of death. Sprinkled among the affluent were our sisters of the second class, and for a time there was that social leveling caused only by the close proximity of death. While getting the addresses from many of the survivors of their relatives, that they might be apprised by Marconi of their safety, I was grappled by a poor woman of the second class who held in her closed fist long strands of hair she had pulled from her head. Holding them on high as though measuring them with her eyes, she frantically shouted to me to find her baby. I promised her I would. Seeing she was mentally unbalanced, a doctor was called and she was put under opiates. When she had gotten into the boat, her baby was being handed to her and somehow was dropped into the sea and drowned. Fortunately, the Carpathia was carrying something more than half she usually accommodates, so the second morning found a great number of the Titanic survivors provided for. The overflow beds were made on the couches in the lounge and pallets or blankets were made on the floor. The first night, Many of the men slept on the deck in the steamer chairs. Others slept in the smoking room and dining salon. The captain gave up his stateroom, it accommodating four of the socially representative ladies. The barber fortunately had in stock a few dozen toothbrushes, combs, and other toilet articles. The Carpathia's objective points being ports on the Mediterranean, she was carrying on an extra large supply of food. In that line, there was nothing left to be desired. On reaching the Carpathia, the first thing found necessary to be done was to relieve the anxiety of relatives of the survivors. Immediately on obtaining the addresses, I visited the Marconi quarters and left written messages that had to be paid before sending, though there were many who had little or no funds. The second officer, who acted as spokesman for the crew of the Titanic, stated that their services were at an end when the Titanic sank, and upon reaching New York, they would be sent adrift. It was immediately seen to that their transportation to England would be given, and also employment on reaching there. The three succeeding days were spent among the passengers, listing their needs and making provision in the way of clothes, as many escaped in their night clothing, over which was drawn a cloak, a number who were in our boat had only sandals on and no stockings. The day before landing, three Irish girls were found in the steerage, 
they having kept their births since the rescue, having no clothes, and refusing to rise with blankets only to wrap around them. They were among the passengers going to New York. As the Carpathia was nearing the harbor, it was surrounded by smaller boats that went out to meet it, in which were newspaper men and photographers to take flashlights. They impeded the progress of the Carpathia. The excitement of this and the captain calling through a megaphone to the pilot to disperse the crafts or he would be una unable to reach the docks, and the seeing and hearing of the multitude of humanity on the wharf so frightened these women that they refused to quit the ship and go with the ladies of the Traveler's Aid Society, who came on to take them to a place of safety until friends were found and arrangements were made for them to either return to their homes in Europe or other destinations in America. Feeling it a duty to remain with those, and after the army of Red Cross doctors and nurses, White Star Line officials and General Aid Corps had taken leave of the ship. We found it was necessary to improvise beds in the lounge, so I remained with them on board all night. There were many who had friends on the dock, but did not know them. So with each one was sent an escort, and the names called out, and those finding their friends would return to the ship and report, and we kept a list of their whereabouts. For some of those remaining, telegrams were sent that night, and the next morning, friends of many came aboard, and the others, less fortunate, consented to go with the ladies of the Traveler's Aid, conditionally that they would be allowed to see me at the Ritz-Carlton, where I would be, and I promised to have their various consuls there, and we would try to find their friends, whose addresses their husbands had when the ship sank. Those took some days afterwards. The next morning on the ship, I was joined with five members of the committee, who brought on $5,000, so they said, in funds to be distributed among the much overworked crew of the Carpathia. This being done, an order was given for the Loving Cup, to be presented to the captain on the return of his ship from Naples. Having taken a list of those of the survivors who were to be assisted, a copy was made and given to the White Star agents who came on the boat. The further work of the committee of the survivors of the Titanic was to see by keeping check that the company was keeping their promise and that all were cared for. The only comment that could be made was that the Carpathia did not follow the customary procedure on boats. Where there is death on board, they usually bury them at night, in place of adding to the horror of passengers by burying the men who died on board after being rescued from the collapsible boat at the hour of four in the afternoon when the passengers were around. They possibly may have had a good and sufficient reason for such departure from the usual procedure. The men who died were rescued by the lifeboat in which were the four prominent lady personages. In rescuing these, the plug in their lifeboat was dislodged, and a foot of water covered the bottom of their boat, which, to prevent the filling of the boat, it was needful that they bail it out with a large dipper hanging from the seat. In the boat, two of the men rescued, I was told, died, and lay for hours in the bottom of the boat during the six hours on the open sea before the passengers were rescued by the Carpathia. It was very apparent that the consideration and solicitation shown toward the unfortunate survivors had been taken exception to from some sources. On one occasion, when ladies of the committee stopped to inquire the way to reach the second and third class, they were intercepted by the doctor as he emerged from the quarters of the secluded plutocrat. He approached one of the ladies and said, Madam, we have the situation under perfect control. Blankets have been cut up, and we are having clothes made. Cutting up blankets would not soothe their tortured minds. Then and there, we were more determined, and a notice was posted that the hours of 11 to 1 and 3 to 6, the committee would be in the dining salon. During these hours, the survivors came in twos and fours, and poured out their grief and story of distress. Between flow of tears, they unburdened their sorrows that lay like a weight upon their breasts. The gratitude shown by these people and the evidence that the great mental strain they were under was partly relieved when they knew that someone was interested in their welfare 
was proof conclusive to the committee that they were working along the right lines, regardless of how the doctor felt in the matter. Feeling that he was voicing only the sentiment of the secluded autocrat, a number of these foreign women of the first and second class were told that now they had no funds, their arrival in America would be under the alien law. They were terrified at their being subject to such humiliation. They were fully convinced that such was not the case, that they would be provided with means and transportation. They arose and said their loads were then and there lifted, and their minds were very much relieved. Another instance when the ladies were made to feel that they were overstepping their bounds in their endeavor to relieve the situation for those people was when the resolutions were read. They were told emphatically it was an absolute affront to the owner and manager who was on board. We replied we were only compelled to do what he had neglected as his duty. If this interest had been shown by him, it would have placed him in a very different light than that of doing as he did, concealing himself behind closed doors to the exclusion of everyone. The contrast was extremely noticeable, as he was the most conspicuous figure on the Titanic before she went down. He was six feet tall and of the oriental type, with manner of pacing the deck with an expression of intensity, of purpose and determination. He had always been in extreme evidence. Assuming this attitude at this time was extremely ridiculous. In passing up the stairs at noon on the day we were rescued, two tall men stood aside for me to pass. Looking up, I saw the face of the man and his friend who had told me to get my life preserver and who later put me into the boat when I was walking away on the Titanic. Putting out my hand, it is needless to say how profuse I was in expressing my gratitude. I asked to whom I was indebted for my life and safety. He handed me their cards reading Calderhead and Bow, Buyers for Kimball Brothers, New York. They stated that in seeing the distress of many women who were bereft of their husbands and some who had perished, it made them feel exceedingly embarrassed and their attitude in keeping out of sight other than when they came to the dining salon for meals was that of men feeling that their lives being saved was somewhat of a stigma and the worn expression of their faces as though they continually were asking themselves the question, what woman's place in the lifeboat did they fill? And in an apologetic way, they told how inadvertently they caught the last boat being lowered half empty. They told me of the navigation laws restricting men from the boats when women and children were on board. I replied that such must have been the ancient law, and now that equal rights existed, truly all should be relieved, as I chance, that their conscience on that score should be relieved, as I was living evidence of their thoughtfulness to womankind. At the time they placed me in the boat, I had no intention of getting off, but was most concerned in knowing what was taking place on the other side of the steamer and marveling all the while at the clumsiness of the crew in letting down the lifeboats, comparing the discipline of what I had seen in my travels on German liners, where a daily drill of military tactics in handling lifeboats took place. It was truly shown at the time that the crew of the Titanic were amateurs in comparison to what I had seen on a German ship on the China Seas when we encountered the outer forces of a typhoon that set us aground until the tide took us out to the rescue of those floating around in the wreckage of a submerged tramp steamer. The comparison seemed crude indeed, as there was no organization or discipline shown at the time, though it was known as soon as she struck the high iceberg and when riding over the submerged one, the bottom of the boat was ripped off as immediately trunks began to float about in the hold and an officer was seen dragging at the mailbags a few minutes after she struck, giving them time to realize the worst had happened and for the crew to be at their post. On the contrary, it was plain to see that of the 70 stewards who were saved, none attempted to warn those in the staterooms of their danger. One of the heroes on board was the 18-year-old son of the Thayers of Philadelphia. 
He and his father, after having taken an affectionate farewell of his mother, after placing her in the lifeboat while walking on the deck of the Titanic, plunged off. While swimming, he was drawn twice under the keel by the suction. In his struggles, he grasped hold of the collapsible boat and was among those who were rescued. He was on board the Carpathia when his mother was hoisted from the lifeboat. She was under the impression that both her husband and son had perished on the Titan Titanic. But to her supreme joy, she was clasped in her son's arms. In her great thankfulness in having one spared her, for the rest of the voyage, not more than a few minutes at a time, would she permit him to be separate from her. The attitude of the men who were rescued was indeed pathetic. Each and all seemed as though they were trying to efface themselves when they were encountered passing to and fro. It was noticed how they all tried to explain how it came about like a miracle that their lives were saved with an expression of apology as though it were a blight on their manhood. One man displayed an order he had demanded from the officer when he asked to get in the lifeboat half filled when women that he might row, all stating that they took the boats when there was no one around to get in. The third day on the Carpathia, I talked at great length with one of the officers of the Titanic, who had had in his command five lifeboats, he having the one that went back and rescued those on the collapsible. In talking it over, he stated that they saw to it that among those who were saved would not be any of the rich nabobs, again reiter reiterating the same, adding, we saw to it that they would have would take their chances with good men. While preening his feathers over this fact, he stated that there was no one who got through without the officers knowing it. He later displayed his weapon and told how that he made one who persistently attempted to get in the boat with his wife. He was told in the strong expletive of the masculine lexicon to chase himself around the deck. He stated the only thing he regretted was the oaths he had used toward the ladies in the boat. That concludes the account of Margaret Brown of the sinking of the Titanic. If you made it to the end, congratulations and thank you for sticking around. If you liked what you heard here, please subscribe to my channel. Please share with anyone you think who might uh, like this channel. It will not exclusively be Titanic. It's going to be all kinds of different topics. I will do more like this, but I also will do ones where I uh, go out in the field and see where things happened. And um, I think it will be a fun place. So I appreciate you listening and... Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.